what you mentioned about the the bus growth kind of saturating and then the car growth taking over um did that turn out to be also part of like a really good launching bed because i know catl is now expanded obviously to factories all over the world um can you share maybe any insights that you uh, gained by kind of taking what had been built for the bus market and then taking it to the next level for kind of the uh, more uh, just average electric vehicles? Well, there's a big difference between the bus battery packs and the uh, electric car battery packs because the car's energy densities required a different chemistry to get the kind of energy densities required to get the range that the uh, consumers would expect. Uh, nearly all the buses in the first uh, five years, if not all, had uh, what we call an LFP chemistry in it. Lithium iron phosphate is a very safe chemistry. It is uh, less prone to abuse than other types of chemistries. It has great cycle life and it behaves quite well in wide temperature ranges. So nearly every bus that we put on the road for the first several years has lithium iron phosphate batteries in it. It wasn't until the need of getting higher energy densities for passenger cars that we started making the trimetal, trimetal, excuse me, trimetal uh, chemistry of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And because of proprietary uh, uh, issues, I can't say a whole lot more about that other than that CATL made several different kinds of uh, NMC technology over the years. And uh, certainly they're, they're pushing very hard to try to decrease the amount of cobalt, because as we all know, cobalt is the major cost factor in most of the NMC blends, and we're trying our best to uh, reduce that amount of cobalt. So consequently, that's why you see nearly every major car manufacturer, every battery manufacturer today using 811 for NMC technologies because it uses much less cobalt and a lot more nickel. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the kind of the need of the range for the electric buses. What uh, could you share kind of roughly what the average pack size for something like that would be and maybe what their uh, range would be? Well, the, the, the bus battery packs is kind of a different configuration because they do have the space under the passenger to put the batteries. And, and there's, there's four different categories of buses. There's a small bus where you have typically a, a four to six pack complement. And then there's a mid-sized bus that has uh, maybe eight to 12 battery packs. Then you've got uh, the larger 40, 40 to 50 foot bus that uh, will have uh, typically uh, 12 to 18 battery packs in it. And then you have the big articulating buses, the really long buses that will carry even more battery packs. But uh, we found out through a few years of production that a standard battery pack for buses was the right architecture and was the most cost effective. So we basically started building uh, more of a standard battery pack for buses but electric cars, every car manufacturer wanted their own specific design to fit the specific space inside the uh, electric car. So it's interesting that you bring this up, Chase, because there are other applications of using the uh, bus battery pack. And I'll, I'll mention that the heavy duty industry and uh, an old friend of mine at Leo Gong uh, started buying these bus battery packs and putting them into construction equipment at Leo Gong and I was in Beijing a few years ago for the unveiling of a brand new series of electric construction machines, a 22 ton excavator, a 20 ton payloader wow. and a 12 ton excavator. And uh, it was quite uh, fortunate for me that the last month before my retirement, I flew down to be at Leo Gong and actually drive these electric machines. And it's quite humbling to be able to handle a huge machine in absolute quiet other than the grinding and scraping that you have when you pick up rocks and dirt and things like that. So uh, uh, the need for those kind of uh, big machines are quite evident, particularly in the mining industry. The mining industry is fascinated by electric uh, uh, construction equipment like this because in excavating, uh, during the working of a diesel engine, sometimes these really hot embers come out of the uh, combustion process, and if for whatever reason the backhoe had just dug into a pocket of gas and it's coming out, you don't know it, those hot embers can actually ignite the, uh, uh, the gas that's coming out of, out of the uh, mine and uh, blow it up. So uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in the mining industry. There's also a huge incentive for doing this for urbanization. 
because um, uh, large cities, when they're doing lots of construction, these big machines create a lot of smoke. And I know you've seen it. Uh, yeah. When these excavators are digging a lot of dirt, uh, they put up, they belch out a lot of black smoke from the diesel uh, combustion process. And typically they're using dirty sulfur diesel. And uh, so these, these electrified machines, I think is gonna be the wave of the future and be a big help to reduce pollution in our world. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a huge opportunity there, not just from uh, environmental pollution, but also like you even mentioned, noise pollution and mm -hmm. um, the torque that you could probably put into these along with the pneumatic systems they already have to make some pretty powerful systems. Uh, for just like I said, out of curiosity for like a average electric bus, would that be like 300 to 500 kilowatt hours or what, what kind of is it closer like a well, full megawatt for the um, energy that was usually needed? I, I, I really don't know much about, uh, I've always uh, thought it made sense. Cause like you said, the energy density requirements and I can't imagine most buses go more than maybe 90 miles if maybe even 50 a day. So it seems like a great opportunity for them. Yeah, uh, Chase, I, I wanna be careful how I answer that question gotcha. because <laughs> each and every bus configuration is different and uh, the, the amount of energy that's put in will be different based on the uh, need for the application that it has. But you can imagine that those battery packs could have anywhere from 10 to 15 kilowatt hours per pack. And if you've got, uh, you know, 10 to 20 of those on a bus, yeah. it's a lot of energy, right? So it depends on the, uh, it depends on the purchase order for the bus manufacturer, but suffice it to say that it's, uh, it, it gained a very fast recognition with the Chinese government because it was uh, reducing pollution and saving lives. Um, you know, even uh, Premier Lee Keqiang during a dinner one night, he mentioned to me uh, that he was thanking Robin Zung and CATL for the uh, job that they did in reducing the amount of pollution uh, in China by helping make electric uh, battery pack systems for buses. So wow. it's, uh, nice. it was quite, yeah. quite, a, quite a rewarding uh, accolade coming from Premier Lee Keqiang. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to visit our website, connectingthegrid.com. There you can listen to our podcasts, contact us about sponsorship, or even be a guest on Grid Connections. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a positive rating on your favorite podcast or video streaming service. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out a lot too. Thank you again, and I look forward to us learning more together soon.